Thanks for tuning in to the 168 Podcast, a podcast from Mitchell Knight and Jordan Bird of the Clarence Church of Christ, aimed at helping you connect Sunday worship with everyday life. What's up, 168ers? Welcome back to another edition of the podcast. This is take two, where hopefully I will not make any mistakes. Today, we are continuing our mini-series on the shortest books of the New Testament, which today means the Johannan Epistles. So that would be 1 John, 2 John, and 3 John. So Jordan, did you uh, have any introductory thoughts regarding uh, the Johannan Epistles? I would say... Just this doesn't have any super deep meaning, but from my just general experience, I have more practical interaction with probably first John and not as much second or third John. Um, even just sort of looking over it before doing this, there's nothing that I recall ever like super standing out from second or third John. Not that there's not, just it's not one of those letters or books from the Bible that typically get sort of mentioned. Although in during youth group, we've used them as like sword drill for, you know, verses or references to look up because they, they see they're obscure for somewhat. Like they're just, they're super small. They're not the ones you would tend to just like flip to, you know, just, you almost have to purposely go there to find it in your Bible. Cause it's, you know, small within the rest of the books of the Bible. And so that's one thing for sure that stands out to me. Um, but I do know, I mean, obviously like, from the authorship and whatnot, like there's a coherence or a sinking that goes together with all three of them by the way they came about. Um, but I would say first John has had probably the most impression on me as far as all three of the letters. Is there anything for you specifically that stands out? Yeah, I'd agree with first John being the most influential in my life. I think second and third John are just kind of more of the extensions of who the author of the epistles is. Um, and they're consistent with a lot of the themes that are brought up in First John. Um, I think when I the, the main theme that I get out of these epistles and these letters is the idea that you know I mean he even says it in the first chapter of First John that God is light. He's the totality of light. There's no darkness in him. So what he's doing, and he introduces this idea in the second chapter of First John. He's writing to us so that we will not sin. You know, his idea is that by reminding us that God is entirely light, and if we're aligned with the light and life of God, we should be motivated to put off the darkness in us. We don't, we're not doomed in Christ to repeat the same kind of things that we used to do. Um, You know, darkness is this enslavement, it's this thing that separates us from God. So, why would we want to willingly go back to that? You know, we want to put that off and we want to pursue the light of God. But at the same time, you know, when he says, I'm writing to this to you so that you may not sin, he says, I'm right. But also if any of you does sin, know that we have an advocate with the father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. So God is also entirely light where, um, the darkness that we face or the darkness that seeps out of us, um, is no match for his grace, his mercy and his forgiveness. And you know, he proceeds then to encourage a bunch of different people um you know in the church you know by age group or by designation and just saying like you know young men you've overcome the evil one you know um i don't have the rest in front of me but that's for, for me i mean that's the the most influential um you know like the battles won and um you know as christians we should want to pursue light and if there's darkness in us that we're willingly choosing and that's seeping out of us, we should question that part of ourselves. We should repent from that. Like it's not, he's kind of like getting at this idea that you, you just can't do whatever you want. Like God is entirely light. So don't let there be darkness in you. But at the same time, it's like, if you mess up, well, you have an advocate and it's like, you're, you're forgiven. It's like, we're not, necessarily going to be perfect but we're called to a life of righteousness and i think that's kind of what he's getting at yeah the follow-up on that i mean jesus is ultimately the key to the symbolism if you will of light and darkness because on one hand with that imagery like light is the appealing dynamic there and darkness is the you know the non-appealing side of that and 
on one hand, that imagery gives us a perception of reality. Like perfection is the light and then the non-perfection is darkness. And it does demonstrate something about who God is or what is ultimately you know, the higher ideal, if you will. And it's, you know, God is perfect. It reveals that, I mean, this part of this letter does reveal like who God is. He's this per- perfect being and that perfect being has come to make himself known to us in the person of Jesus. But at the same time, because God is so perfect, there can be a temptation on our end as humans who are finite and who are, have sin messing with our perception of reality that it's like, well, God's God and I can never relate to that to him or can interact with a perfect being like that, or let alone, uh, serve or participate with a, a perfect being like that. And so there's this weird dynamic of like, yes, God is light, but then like, we, but we live in this like in between where it's like we see some light, but there's darkness intertwined with it. And, and yet we have, you know, the author of this letter saying like, you know, you, you got to pick one or the other, like you can't have them mixed together. And we're like, well, that's the reality for us almost to some degree. But like I said, the key here is Jesus because Jesus is the one who can enter into human reality and then do it perfectly. And then through his breaking the power of sin and death on the cross and his resurrection, then invites us into the possibility of actually living into that perfection through the power of his spirit. But it's only through that. And so again, it's, it's us being bound to the life of Jesus in that way that we have any hope of actually living into the life of light that we see Jesus living out that we see that which is the essence of who God is. But yeah, I think going back to just the whole light and dark thing, I mean, one thing about just that imagery alone makes me think of is even I've used this illustration before uh, talking about sin, how sin is in it at its heart, if you will, is really like it. it we want to think of it as a thing. But really, it's the lack of something. It's the lack of Godness or God's life or God's light in our world. It's it's a yeah, it's, it's, an ab- it's an absence of it. So like you know, it's, it's removal from what is true. So like the one illustration I've used before that I got from somewhere else is like if you think of a, a hole in a sock, like what is the hole in the sock? Well, there's a reference point because we see something there, but what we see is actually the absence of not a the material, not a thing. It's, there's not a thing there. It's the absence of a thing. And so the same is true with sin. Sin is the absence of God in our life. And yet Jesus is the one who like bridges that, that gap. He's the one who refills that hole, if you will. And so a lot of, of what John ends up saying in this letter. And I think even the, the, the following two has a lot to do with like, it doesn't make any sense unless you're looking at it through the lens of Jesus. He's definitely the key to it. And so, and you see some of this interspersed throughout what he writes. It's not just about you're a perfect person or you're just messed up. And we, I think we tend to, as humans can end up in one place or the other, like, well, I messed up. So what's the point of even trying <laughs> to do the, the good or the right or a perfect thing? Well, yeah, the reality is you are a human being. You're finite. You're not, you can't do everything. You, you do live in a world that's impacted by sin, but we are, can cling to the one who is perfect. And that's the one who makes it possible for us to, yes, even though we're flawed, even though we do make mistakes, we still are impacted by darkness. Doesn't mean that we can't experience the light as well. So yeah, that, that's definitely something that stands out to me. Just kind of looking at the whole of, of the, the letters for sure. For me, one other thing that stands out from first John specifically is in chapter four, in uh, verse eight, and it's kind of just through that whole chapter, but the reality of where John talks about God is love and just the character of God that shines through in like a grammatical way, I guess, or like in, in language. I mean, Jesus represents this in a tangible, physical, lived out way, but it's very just directly said in here in this letter of if you want to know who God is, he's love. Like he's, if you want your image of God can't be different than that. Essentially is kind of what it boils down to. And we're so tempted to think of God other than that, whether it's like he's vindictive or he's just mean or something along those lines. But even the, the idea of love has to be tempered of. It's not just like, as some people would say, like a doting grandpa or like, you know, the, 
cosmic Santa Claus or something like that. Like there's some real weight to what that love means. And it, there's some, there's truth bound to that. There's reality bound to that. And it's not void of meaning. There is a standard that that love is, is connected to, if you will. Um, but it, it's love in that shape. It's love in the shape of how the way Jesus lives, lived his life. And that was with me, meaning and purpose. And it was to live out the reality of God's life that he lived or lives for eternity and made it known here on earth for us to experience as well. But first John four, eight has definitely been like a linchpin verse for me in a lot of ways of just reminding myself like who God is, that he is love. And so you can't, look at God or look at Jesus and not see God in that fashion. And we're so tempted to think of him other than that. So I don't know if you have anything to go off on that or if you have a different point you want to focus toward. Yeah. I, I think the other thing is like, I mean, it's very controversial to the idea of like, Oh, well, if I'm just a righteous person or if I just, you know, do a bunch of good things, I can get into heaven kind of a thing that we might have to deal with today. But what John's saying is like God's life or like who God is, you know, he's love and he's not separated from the life of Christ. I mean, like Christ is who reveals the very nature of God to us. I mean, he's kind of the end all be all. So, I mean, he mentions multiple times. It's like, if you deny the son, you don't have the father just as like, if you denied the father, you don't have the son. So there's kind of that duality there. And, I just, you know, I was thinking like the other thing about, um, you know, that light intertwined with darkness. It's like John here is kind of getting into the idea that, um, well, we're not perfect, but we should still strive in repentance to be perfect kind of thing. And what what clears all that up, like you're saying, is like that Jesus is the key. Like Jesus, like it says in Hebrews, entered the most holy place as the high priest and the sacrifice, offered his blood. Like it's the one-time perfect sacrifice. It's not us. It's not our sacrifice that's in there. It's Jesus that's in there. Like we're freed from the curse of rule following. We're not called into repentance like you know, law observant repentance. We're not saying, oh, well, I broke a bunch of rules, so now I just got to follow the rules. It's like, no, these rules represent, you know, what is real, right? Sin is the absence of what these rules are pointing us towards, which is this true morality, this true existence. Um, and now through Christ's sacrifice, knowing that we don't have to be perfect, we can pursue God's righteousness through the law without the fear of having to be perfect. Like that's what repentance is. It's not trying to turn from not rule following to rule following. It's turning from the darkness, what has separated me from God to the light, to what is true, to doing what is right, to doing what is moral, to following after Christ and his teaching, which reveals the fullness of life uh, that is offered to us. Like that's what we're called into like the the whole perfection thing you know Christ's sacrifice being there is what has taken care of that but we still want to align ourselves with the light like he's saying because it's right like that's what we're called to do so hopefully that made sense yeah so like it's a lot of stuff to say but i'll start from 8 which oh, says cover um, <laughs> if we <laughs> cuz that's all i mean if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sin and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Yeah. So on one hand, I think you could look at that and just think, well, I can screw up as much as I want and it doesn't matter. But on the other hand, there is a call within those verses of, no, you should walk in the light. Like that's the ideal. That's the end goal. Perfection is what you're, we're aiming for, but there's also a realization that you're not going to be perfect and you're only, and you're not going to be perfect. And the only way you're going to be perfect is through me. Yes. And so again, it all comes back to none of this, like none of a life of perfection or, I mean, even perfection is kind of a weird thing. Cause like our idea of like what perfection would be is probably very limited to what God's perception, perception, perception of, 
that perfect is. And it's a lot fuller and more beautiful form of what perfection is than even what we would think it would be. And um, did I say it right again? No, I'm you did. Wondering you did. if I said it <laughs> right. Anyway, um, so yeah, um, that definitely makes me think of that for sure. The other thing, the first John makes me think of is a lot of times. I mean, you know, WWE is a WWE or F or uh, NFL where it's like the you used to have the John three sixteen signs, right? Oh, that anyway. was everywhere. That anyway, was everywhere. John three sixteen is like a pretty well known verse by a lot of people, and yet First John three sixteen is very parallel to it. And and I would probably say like John three sixteen is a description of what God has done in showing love to us through Jesus, and then First John three sixteen is the follow up to that of like this is how you as followers of Jesus can live into the love He showed to us toward others, where it says this is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down His life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. Mm-hmm. So it even kind of encapsulates for or John three sixteen of the Christ laying down his life. But then it's like, but then you follow in that example as well. And uh, again, so like love isn't just this like, Oh, it feels good. It's like, there's some, there's a, there's a way in which it's lived out and it's lived out in the way in which Christ lived it out, which is giving, you know, sa- self-sacrificing yourself for the benefit of another in relation to the, the goodwill that God wants to ultimately see happen in all people's lives. And so that that's another verse that definitely stands out to me from at least first John for sure. But I think as a whole, and you already touched on this a little bit of all of the letters touched to a degree on the, the life of God as a whole, not just looking at Jesus specifically, but there's so many references to like, you can't see Jesus without the father and the father without the son. And, and the spirit is like the binding that sort of maintains that relationship. And so again, it reminds us that, the life that we're called to experience and gain in following Jesus, the salvation that we gain, the life that we gain is experiencing the fullness of life that God has experienced for eternity. And he gifts that to us to, and invites us to have uh, participate in that kind of life, the life that, that he has lived in the where there was no beginning. He has always existed. He alone existed, but yet was never alone. And that, I think can encapsulate a lot of our lives. Like in some ways we know we exist, (laughs) but we also feel like we exist alone and we don't have anyone else in our life yet. God is inviting you into a way of life where you're never alone. And that's good news that we can cling to that. I think it's sort of there in a broad sense throughout all of these, these letters of like, this is who God is. And um, it's a life that we get, we have the privilege of being a part of and participating in because of Jesus. Do you have anything else you want to add to our discussion here? Any other points? Yeah. I mean, I just, I just would echo again that like, I mean the whole pursuit of perfection, understanding you're not perfect thing. Like I just think we're really tempted to kind of break things down to like practices or rules or legalism and stuff like that. It's like, I always have to ask myself, it's like, am I in repentance? Am I following, am I obeying the commands of Jesus just because they're commands? Part of it is yes, like it should be. I mean, John 14 says, you know, if you love me, you will do what I command. But it goes beyond that. And I think that's kind of what he's getting at. It's about pursuing pursuing them because it's right, because it's light. It's the opposite of our former way of life. Like, it's it's not just a scorecard. It's it's just trying to glorify Christ with your very being by being aligned with his light. So, Thank you, everybody, for joining us for this episode of the 168 Podcast, and we'll catch you next time. See you later, 168ers.